Smart Global Holdings, which designs, builds, and manages AI and high-performance computing infrastructure, announcing it secured a $200 million investment from SK Telecom. The company also announcing it plans to change the company name to Penguin Solutions, which is its biggest brand. Joining us now is Mark Adams, SGH CEO. Mark, good to see you. Great, thanks for having me. So maybe um, start on that news, Mark, this, this, um, this news that you all make you know, like a $200 million strategic investment mm -hmm. from SK Telecom. How has that news come about? What's gonna mean for your business, Mark? Well, I think uh, if you look at what we've done very well over the last couple of decades is we got to understand the infrastructure environment and high performance computing. Penguin's been around for about 25 years. And if you think of, really couldn't be a better precursor to AI than HPC, because you, you start with cooling systems and power, processors, memory, storage, networking, management software, and those are all things we do very, very well, in addition to our professional services that actually deploy these systems. And so, um, SK Telecom is part of SK Group, which is the second largest conglomerate in, in Korea, mm. $250 billion market cap, and they have extensive networking capabilities, processor capabilities, memory with their division SK Hynix, and so they complement what we're all about. And when you think about the last mile of integrating this type of technology, make it all work. Uh, it's a really interesting partnership for us on a global basis because obviously they're very strong internationally. So talk to us a little bit more about where you sit then. Do you, you sit in the last mile then of, of what we're talking about? Because yeah. I know your business is made up of memory in part, LED lighting solutions also, and then the biggest uh, chunk of your business is what you call intelligent platform solutions. Correct. So for Correct. people who are not familiar, tell them what that means and sure. how these different pieces are integrated. Sure. So when you think about um, uh, implementing AI today, all those technologies I just talked about are mm. super complex. For example, we, we last year deployed the world's first oil-based immersion cooling. What does that mean? We literally put computers inside of recycled oil inside of a tank for efficiency use and power and, and actually environmental friendliness. Um, that's just an example of one technology. Advanced compute technology with memory interconnecting with high bandwidth opportunities to increase the performance of GPUs, another good example. Then we have a layer of software on top of it that manages all the environment, knows when predictive stuff is going down as far as uh, fault identification and repair, uh, scheduling and provisioning. And so we have this host of solutions that actually makes the deployment piece pretty seamless for us and that we're really good at that. Mark, I was, I was talking to an analyst who, who knows the company and the industry, and I was saying, well, who are their rivals? And he mentioned names, like he said, I put Dell there, I put HPE there. I mean, those are those are big names, Mark. Sure. I mean, um, yeah. how do you compete there? What are your competitive advantages? Well, the competitive advantages are what I'm referring to is that, that kind of software service layer. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, The company's names you just mentioned are traditionally more hardware focused. And if you look at the margin profile of their business and our business, it's just different. By the way, and they're partners of ours. So it's not bad or good, it's just you know our gross margin is substantially higher because we play in more of a service and uh, software part of the solution. We do have systems, but we also can sell our products on Dell and HP and other systems. What is um, this Gen AI enthusiasm gonna mean for your business? Because you guys are also considerably smaller than some of those names that he just yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Are we gonna start to see growth really ramp up for you guys as well as we've got all this demand for Gen AI? I think that's where we're at actually. I think I used to, I've said in, in kind of prior earnings calls is that 23 and 24 were kind of the years of GPU sales. Everyone was like, GPU is getting sold mm -hmm. off everywhere. Well, now they have to deploy them and there's so little deployment yet really in at corporate enterprise today. The hyperscale is sure and, and we've got one of those as our biggest customer. But if you look at traditional Fortune 500 enterprises, they're all kind of doing proof of concept, but they're not quite sure what AI is going to do. Now we're in that deployment phase and that's going to benefit us, uh, we feel, really in a good way. What, what percentage of your business, Mark, would you say now is, is AI related? Oh, um, if you factor in where we're going with memory, it's kind of two thirds or above and it's going to grow more and more that way. And, and what was it you know, versus, you know, uh, when I started, uh, when I took over the CEO job back in uh, August of 20, mm. it was 78%, 77% memory mm. and very little compute. And, um, you know, as those companies start to figure out what proof of concept is, what's your feeling for, in terms of the broader economic environment and spending environment on the part of potential clients? What's their appetite for spending right now? Well, I think, um, well, the appetite's 
amazing just because the you know boards are saying, hey, what is your app, what is your AI strategy, right? And so companies are um, are trying to define this on the fly because the game's happening. I think what's really encouraging for all the the ecosystem players is that in these large language models, the number of parameters that run these models are going to like triple, quadruple, and, and and so from that perspective, the amount of compute resources and data center resources are going to be substantial. What's interesting right now in the data center spaces, there's not enough of them with AI power. Mm. There's not enough megawatts, so there's a, there's a constraint right now on, on data centers that are enabled to drive AI, and so that's providing a lot of uh, motivation for people to make that investment. So I think it's pretty favorable from an investment standpoint on the infrastructure piece. What about, Martin, just thinking about customers, how about crypto miners, just given all the hardware they buy, is that a natural customer for you all? It's funny you say that, the answer is yeah. absolutely yes, because mm. We have looked at that space for a long time, and given the supply challenges around what I just said in terms of data centers, these people have immense amount of power, and the crypto business is pretty volatile. Yeah. So if you look at some of the bigger AI, uh, sorry, crypto companies that are public companies, they've all announced an AI strategy, and yet they don't necessarily have the experience of 25 years of doing this type of infrastructure. They're great customers. We announced one today at our analyst day. It was our first ever software and services non-hardware deal mm -hmm. with a company called Voltage Park, which is a tier two cloud service provider. We're in installing 24,000, something like that, 24,000 GPUs in four data centers with them. Mm -hmm. Massive deployment, and they're converting, uh, they're converting their business from a prior model. That's true with other, other crypto players. So that's really an interesting point you make. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a note out from uh, economists and researchers at Goldman Sachs earlier this week that said, maybe AI isn't going to be, Gen AI isn't going to be as big as we're thinking it is because, it, the, you know, if you look at it, to your point, it being deployed in enterprises, it's, it's hardly a blip at this point and maybe it's not going to get there. They're not going to figure out what the use cases are. It doesn't sound like though you're seeing that necessarily in your business. Are you still confident that that trajectory is still going to happen as predicted? Well, I mean, there's two, two pieces of that question the way I interpret the, the capital markets. There's just been some irrational valuations going on. And we're an operating company. We make money, we strengthen our balance sheet, what have you. And so we're a little more boring that way. Um, but uh, I think both the answers could be true. I think there's a lot of growth from here because people are now are starting to think about how to deploy it. Now the question is the upside of how much the growth that is. That's a hard one to call. I, I just think where, where people are struggling in the enterprise right now is, okay, I get what the technology can do, but what's it mean to me? Like the classic case study right now is ad revenue. So when we do these searches and people track us, and the next day these ads show up and they're the same ads we're looking at yesterday. Okay, so but if you're in healthcare, if you're in some other business, what's the, what's the kind of commercial value you're driving from an AI strategy? And I think that's the stage we're in is, okay, we understand the technology, how does it commercially become viable to give us an advantage in our business? And that's what we're seeing our customers uh, to spend a lot of time on. Yeah, try to figure out. All right, Mark, thank you so much for coming in. Really yeah, good to talk to you, me. appreciate it.